Okay, the next item of business is a statement by Neil Gray on El Jamel and NHS Tayside Public Inquiry and the Independent Clinical Review. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, therefore there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Neil Gray, Cabinet Secretary, around 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It has been one of my great privileges in the last, in the first few days uh, as Cabinet Secretary for NHS Recovery, Health and Social Care. Uh, to have seen and heard just a small fraction of the excellent work that is going on in our health services across Scotland. <clears throat> I know that we have incredibly dedicated doctors, nurses and care workers across our systems, and I'm truly grateful to them every day. All of us, whether for ourselves or uh, through our families and friends, will have interactions with the NHS, and therefore it is nothing more important to me than ensuring that our health service is safe and effective and that all patients receive the high standard of care we would all expect. We should, however, there be any concern felt about the care or treatment provided in our health service. It is absolutely right that patients or their families know that there are clear channels to raise these concerns and that they can have confidence that these concerns are investigated swiftly, effectively and, where necessary, appropriate action is taken. In September, my predecessor, Michael Matheson, set out in a statement to this Parliament that we would establish both a public inquiry into the actions of Mr El Jamel and NHS Tayside, as well as conducting an independent clinical review for those former patients of Mr El Jamel who would want their case reviewed. In recent days, I have met, albeit briefly, with a number of patients and patient representatives who have suffered terribly as a result of the actions of Mr El Jamel. Firstly, outside the Parliament at the protest last week, and then at a further meeting uh, this morning. The experiences shared with me from these brave individuals are truly shocking. Uh, and I would like to put on record my regret, my sorrow, that their search for answers has taken quite so long. They also have my heartfelt respect for their determination to get to the truth of what has happened. This is why the aims of this inquiry are so important to establish who knew what and when and what factors contributed to the failures described by NHS Tayside's due diligence review. By providing answers to concerns that patients raised about their poor experiences of care, this inquiry will make recommendations to ensure that the appropriate levels of governance and scrutiny are applied in future to prevent a similar circumstance from occurring in any health board in Scotland. Public inquiries are not undertaken lightly. But the commitment Michael Matheson made previously, and which I wholeheartedly agree with, reflects the importance of ensuring that when repeated concerns and questions are raised, those accountable for acting on them do so, that the effectiveness of their actions are scrutinised and lessons are learned through necessary improvements. In addition, work is underway to assess how the various recommendations from previous inquiries and reviews have been implemented to assure me, and ultimately the people of Scotland, that lessons have been learned. Interventions that are found to work to improve patient safety and increase the quality of care must be embedded in the system. As many will be aware, Mr El Jamel was employed by NHS Tayside from 1995 until 2014, and concerns about his practice were first raised to NHS Tayside in 2011. As a result of a complaint received at the end of 2012, two further complaints received in 2013 and two significant clinical event analysis. NHS Tayside commissioned the Royal College of Surgeons in England to review his practice on the 20th of June 2013. Following receipt of the Royal College of Surgeons' final report, Mr El Jamel was suspended in December 2013. Most complaints were then received after he had been suspended. In total, nine reviews have taken place into his practice, including NHS Tayside's due diligence review published last August. This report had laid bare the failings in NHS Tayside's response to concerns over Mr El Jamel. It was clear from this review that these were not acted upon or followed up with the urgency and rigour that they deserved. As Parliament is aware, my predecessor Michael Matheson announced in September that an independent clinical review was also being commissioned alongside the public inquiry. A number of extensive conversations have taken place between officials and prospective chairs in order to ensure the most appropriate and qualified individuals were identified to take these 
vital investigatory processes forward. Mr El Jamel's former patients have the right to answers, and we as government and our public bodies must learn from their experiences to try to ensure that this does not happen again. From my discussions with former patients, including those outside Parliament last week, I understand the strength of their frustrations and of their upset, and therefore the importance of these investigations being progressed as quickly as possible. The people of Scotland must have confidence in our National Health Service and its systems and have trust that any complaints will be investigated. I plan for the public inquiry and independent clinical reviews to help build back any lost trust. Since coming into office uh, three weeks ago, one of the first things that I did was to ask for an update on the appointment of the chairs for both the public inquiry and the independent clinical reviews. And I know colleagues and former patients have a keen interest in the progress made. Today I can report that both chairs have now been appointed. The Honourable Lord Robert Weir will chair the public inquiry. Lord Weir is a sitting judge appointed to the Supreme Court in April 2020, having sat as a temporary judge of the High Court from 2017. As a serving judge with expertise in personal injuries, I'm confident that Lord Weir will bring rigour and transparency to the inquiry. I'll be meeting with Lord Weir and my officials this afternoon, uh, where we'll discuss the planned meeting between Lord Weir and the patients group to be held in the coming weeks, where they will look to endorse the terms of reference for the inquiry. My officials uh, have also progressed several essential inquiry establishment activities, including the process to appoint the solicitor and secretary to the inquiry to support Lord Weir in the development of a plan. This plan will set out the activities to be undertaken and a delivery timeframe, including the establishment of an inquiry team, processes and practices to be utilised, uh, outline investigation plans and proposed dates for publication of inquiry reports. Uh, moving on to the independent clinical review, I am able to announce today that I have appointed Professor Stephen Wigmore, Regis Chair of Clinical Surgery and Head of Department of Surgery at the University of Edinburgh under the National Health Service Scotland Act 1978 to chair the review process. He has extensive experience in leading similar clinical reviews and I am confident he will apply the same level of leadership and integrity to this independent clinical review process. His unique skill set and experience will enable a thorough and independent process and review of patients' clinical records for those patients who wish to partake. But Professor Wigmore is a transplant and HPB surgeon. As such, he will be supported by a group of expert neurosurgeons given the area of Mr Eljamel's practice. This review will be different to the previous reviews as it will offer an individualised approach to each of the former patients who wish to take part. Professor Wigmore has been discussing with my officials the appropriate support required to enable the reviews in a timely but progressive manner. The terms of reference have been drafted by my officials and are with the Chair for consideration. As my predecessor outlined, it is expected that engagement with the former patients and patient advocates will take place prior to finalising these terms of reference. The independent clinical review is anticipated to begin in April with patients being proactively contacted to advise them how to request a review of their clinical records. It is expected that given the potentially large number of former patients, patients will be identified and contacted in tranches to ensure no one is missed. Once a more definitive timeline is available, the independent clinical review team will advise former patients by email or by letter through post. In the meantime, work is already underway in order to event identify all those patients who have been impacted by Mr Eljamel's practice. It is the intention of the independent clinical review to offer the opportunity to all patients who have concerns about their treatment and care from Mr Eljamel while he worked at NHS Tayside. As my predecessor has previously advised the Chamber, these clinical reviews will allow a person-centred, trauma-informed review of each person's own clinical records. This will also address their individual needs and circumstances and aim to offer answers in a bespoke and personalised way that an inquiry could not. The independent clinical review will be separate from the public inquiry. However, it is expected that the findings of the clinical review may form evidence which will be considered by the public inquiry in due course. Finally, presiding officer, as the new health secretary, I would want to assure not just parliament but 
more importantly, those who have suffered at the hands of Mr El Jamel, just how seriously I take this public inquiry. We must get to the truth of what happened to continue to rebuild trust with the public, but also to ensure that vital learning is applied and we can prevent similar circumstances from occurring again. And I will continue to update the Parliament as this work progresses. Thank you. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes, after which we will need to move on to the next item of business. Uh, members wishing to ask a question who have not already done so should press the request to speak buttons. And I call first Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. May I thank uh, Neil Gray uh, for sight of his statement regarding the very welcome appointments of the Honourable Lord Robert Weir and Professor Stephen Wigmore. But can I also say thank you to Neil Gray for his very quick an effective engagement with me about this matter during uh, the very short tenure of his uh, being in post. Presiding officer, we have all heard, uh, for 10 years in my case, the most harrowing stories about the intense and permanent physical and psychological pain of El Jamel's patients, of families being broken apart and of heart-rending accounts of the victims trying to get to the truth, only to be knocked back at every turn. During these 10 years, I have dealt with no fewer than seven health secretaries. And whilst I don't doubt for a minute the sincerity of their sympathy for what the patients have had to endure, there were far too many instances of dither and delay, all of which quite naturally served to heighten the anxiety amongst patients that there were some kind of cover up. In short, we should have been at the start of the public inquiry long before now. So whilst the work will now be in the remit of the judge, quite rightly, independent of government, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he can provide a categorical assurance to this Parliament that he will review the process by which the Scottish Government oversees the work of its health boards and develop a foolproof process by which there is full transparency of decisions that are made both clinical and administrative and full disclosure of who has been involved in these decisions. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And, and can I begin by thanking Liz Smith for her tenacity, for the work that she has uh, undertaken on behalf of her constituents uh, over far too long a period. I think we can agree uh, upon that fact that um, we are in a situation where people have had to wait far too long to get uh, uh, answers and to get to this point. Um, I'm happy to take away uh, a consideration of what more can be done to uh, review our own processes, but I would expect uh, part of the public inquiry's uh, 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 evidence being taken will indeed be to ensure that that type of uh, transparency uh, and uh, rigour uh, is applied uh, across all of our public services, including government. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement and welcome him to the health, health and social care portfolio. Presiding officer, I welcome the announcement of the chairs of the public inquiry and the clinical review process into the El Jamel scandal and NHS Tayside. I want to pay tribute to the tenacity of the many campaigners, but in particular Jules Rose and Pat Kelly. We would not be here today without their determination to see justice done. Now, it's taken almost six months for, a chair, for the chairs to be appointed, but 10 years for the Scottish Government to agree to this. And many of the victims of Dr El Jamel are getting older. Their campaign strapline says, says it all, in my view. They dither, we die. So on that basis, can the Cabinet Secretary pledge that every resource needed is given to the inquiry and that um, the clinical review as well, so that they can properly um, proceed at pace. One of the former patients, um, uh, indeed all of the former patients, need to be properly consulted, not just endorsing the terms of reference, um, and these should be finalised without delay. But secondly, I want to very quickly touch on the clinical review of cases. The Cabinet Secretary will appreciate that trust is in short supply of the victims. Can he therefore give a cast iron guarantee that Jason Leach, the National Clinical Director, will have no role in the review of cases Cabinet or Secretary, in the inquiry Cabinet itself? Secretary. Given Cabinet, the Secretary. The Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I thank Jackie Bailey for her uh, questions. Uh, first of all, uh, can I reiterate her tribute to Jules Rose, to Pat Kelly, who I've 
had the fortune to be able to meet um, last week outside Parliament and again uh, this morning where um, I discussed what I was going to be uh, announcing to Parliament uh, today. Pay tribute to, the, as she described it, their tenacity um, and uh, the hard work that they have put in to get us to where we are today. Um, I think she serves them well in, in her comments. Um, in terms of the resources of both the public inquiry and indeed the uh, clinical review, yes, I, I, I give that uh, undertaking. Uh, in terms of the terms of reference uh, of the public inquiry, uh, there is a meeting to be established with the patients and their representatives and uh, Lord Weir. It will be uh, for that discussion to take place in terms of making sure that the terms of reference meet with their uh, expectations. I, I've said previously, I've said in response to correspondence with Liz Smith, um, that Jason Leach, um, uh, while uh, heading the department and receiving briefings as a director in that department about the progress uh, of the, the, the uh, reviews and the uh, independent inquiry, uh, does not have any day-to-day -day responsibility for their oversight. Thank you. Claire Hockey to be followed by Sanders Gohani. Thank you, President Officer, and I refer members to my register of interest in that I hold a bank contract with the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary give further detail on how the public inquiry and the independent clinical review will work in parallel and complement one another? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. I thank Claire Hockey for those questions. Although the two processes will be operation, uh, operationally independent, the two processes will I hope complement each other to provide answers to former patients and the distinct answers that they're acquiring at different stages. The public inquiry will focus uh, on the actions of Mr El Jamel and NHS Tayside, while the independent clinical review uh, will produce individual case reviews which will be provided directly to the former patient or their families uh, and a report on the collective reviews and common themes. So it's expected that the findings of the clinical review uh, may form evidence which will be considered by the public inquiry in due course. Sandra Skolhani to be followed by Emma Harper. I declare my interest as a practising NHS GP. I welcome the public inquiry and welcome both chairs. El Jamel has brought the medical profession into disrepute. He is a disgrace. And whilst there have been clear clinical failures, it is abundantly clear that NHS managers have had significant questions to answer about their role in allowing El Jamel to continue to work despite mounting evidence and other decisions that they took. So does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that NHS managers should be regulated, as doctors and nurses are, by an independent body with legal purpose of protecting, promoting and maintaining the health and safety of the public? Cabinet Secretary. I, I thank Sandish uh, Galhani for his questions and he's right to point out the fact that there have been uh, clear failings that have been underlined by the due diligence uh, report uh, into clinical failings, of that there is no doubt, but also uh, failings uh, of management. Uh, I would expect the public inquiry to look into that in uh, detail uh, and for recommendations to come through that to inform uh, better practice uh, and any recommendations as he would expect in order for us to ensure that we rebuild the trust of the people uh, I would expect government to respect and to uh, implement. Emma Harper to be followed by Michael Mara. Thank you. I too want to remind Chamber that I'm still a nurse and my experience was in the perioperative environment. Can the Cabinet Secretary speak to the importance of ensuring patients are involved in every step of the process so that their voices and experiences are heard? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, thank you, President Officer. Thank Emma Harper. I think uh, colleagues across the Chamber have already uh, set out the importance of ensuring that patients are at the heart of this process. The very essence of a public inquiry is to put the public front and centre, providing a platform for their experiences to be listened to and voices heard. To that end, the terms of reference for the review and the inquiry will be developed in consultation with patients and their representatives to ensure that the right focus and scrutiny is given to the right issues, all of which aiming to identify the right lessons to be learned and areas where patient safety and care improvements are required and then delivered. Michael Mara to be followed by John Swin. Uh, my constituent Pat Kelly's experience of his own case note review, which he received in 2022, has been utterly dreadful. Can the Cabinet uh, Secretary tell us today whether this new independent <coughs> clinical review process can ensure patients' views and evidence are included rather than simply reviewing documentation in which patients have no faith? And my constituents and their fellow victims have almost no trust left 
and NHS Tayside. The culture of cover-up in the Health Board has denied them justice for years. What discussions has the Cabinet Secretary had with the new Chief Executive of NHS Tayside to lay out to her that this leadership culture of cover-up and denial, a culture of managing headlines instead of honest transparency, must change? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I thank uh, Michael Mara for his question and also recognise uh, the work that he has done uh, on behalf of, of his uh, constituent, Pat Kelly, uh, bringing these issues uh, to the Chamber and to Government. In the first instance, I, I recognise that lack of trust. I have heard it from the patients myself, and I, I more than uh, understand and appreciate that. That is why the, the clinical review, the public inquiry, must proceed uh, in a way that meets the needs and, and services the needs uh, of the patients, and why the consultation with them by Lord Weir and by Professor Wigmore will be uh, so important. Uh, in terms of uh, the uh, recommendations for NHS Tayside, obviously uh, the, the public inquiry must take its course, but of course in the interim my expectation is that all health boards uh, take seriously complaints, take seriously the concerns uh, of people uh, who uh, report them uh, and ensure uh, that we uh, all share uh, the, the clear channels and routes by which people can raise concerns and complaints, uh, the independent uh, ombudsman process as, as an example, as well as the whistleblower that, stays with, uh, that uh, rests within them uh, to ensure that those patients' concerns can be met. John Swinney to be followed by Willie Rennie. President, sir, given the pressures on the National Health Service with which we are all familiar, is the Cabinet Secretary satisfied that there will be adequate access to clinical advice and input to enable Professor Wigmore to undertake the independent clinical reviews so that the process is a deeper process than simply a process of examining historical records but can provide some good clinical anal analysis for individuals who have been so wronged by the treatment of Professor El Jamel. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you. And I, I, again, I recognise uh, John Swinney's uh, long-standing interest uh, and work in this uh, area. Of course, um, Professor Wigmore uh, will be supported by a group of expert neurosurgeons, given the area of Mr El Jamel's practice. Once the number uh, of el eligible former patients are identified, uh, he will consider what level of support is required to facilitate timely reviews. Uh, this will need to be uh, an opportunity that is open to any former patient who wishes to partake. So, As such, I would like to uh, uh, reassure uh, Mr Swinney and colleagues across the Chamber that we will not allow anyone to be turned away because of cost or resource. Willie Rennie to be followed by Jackie Dunbar. This Parliament, this Government has tested the patience of the victims of Mr El Jamel, but these appointments I think are serious appointments and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that. Time is short for many of them. They have suffered for many years and have suffered very deeply. So what practically can the Cabinet Secretary do to make sure that both the inquiry and the review are carried out in good time? Cabinet Secretary. I thank Willie Rennie uh, for his question and for, uh, again, his involvement uh, in raising these issues for a long period of time. Um, I uh, very well recognise that strength of feeling uh, that he uh, outlines and also the need for these processes to operate in a timely way. Obviously, I can't uh, give a confirmation around uh, the length of time the public inquiry will take. That is for the chair to determine independently in terms of how he uh, chooses to proceed. Um, I do know that the clinical reviews are due to begin in April, uh, and I hope that that will uh, s provide some comfort to those patients who have waited too long for this pro these processes to begin, uh, that there is uh, a momentum building and uh, the processes are uh, beginning in order for them to get answers to the questions that they seek. Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Gillian Mackay. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary reassure former patients who arrange an individual clinical case review that they will be treated with the utmost dignity and respect under the review process? Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely. Um, I, I absolutely give that assurance. And I know um, that my conversations with Lord Weir uh, shortly and, and any conversations that I have to come with uh, Professor Wigmore, that I, I don't believe that that will be something that I need to impress upon. I, I think that is something that they will take incredibly seriously. Uh, we must put the patients at the heart of this process, must ensure that they're treated with dignity and respect, uh, and that we get the answers that they so desperately crave. Gillian Mackay to be followed by Tess White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Could I firstly offer the apologies of Maggie Chapman, who is very keen to be asking a question, but due to a personal emergency, can't be here this afternoon. 
On her behalf, could I ask what work is ongoing to make sure that when all potential victims have been identified, that they are kept up to date with the inquiries as they progress to ensure that they have all the answers they deserve and how, in the meantime, trust can be rebuilt between the public and the Health Board? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you. Uh, I thank uh, Gillian Mackay uh, for those questions. I think um, that in terms of making sure that the, the trust is rebuilt, I set, I set out in my statement the importance uh, of that uh, in this process. Uh, I'm due to meet Lord Weir uh, briefly this afternoon, um, and uh, I'll make sure that part of that discussion is both to uh, impress upon the question that Willie Rennie set out in terms of timescales, uh, but also the point that Gillian Mackay makes in terms of making sure uh, participants, or potential participants, are kept updated, and I'll make sure that that is also communicated to uh, Professor Wigmore. Tess White to be followed by David Torrance. To ask Neil Gray if the Scottish Government will ensure that all the records of the Scottish Government meetings and engagements with the LGML former patients, which do go back a long time, will be made available to the public inquiry. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, uh, the Scottish Government will fully cooperate with uh, ensuring that all documentation that we have available is passed on. And finally, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary say more about how, once it is in place, inquiry will ensure that lessons are learned and that robust safeguards are in place for patients? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. I thank David Torrance. Um, uh, as indicated, the, the public inquiry will produce findings uh, and recommendations. It will be for this Government to work with all parties, public bodies, to ensure that necessary improvements are made, including those relating to patient care and safety. It is beholden uh, on us all to do so. I spoke in my statement about trust. For services to maintain or regain trust, we must respect the process and the re recommendations to ensure lessons are learned, and I absolutely intend on doing just that. Thank you. That concludes this item of business. There will be a brief point of order. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, can I seek your advice on whether the Scottish Government has contacted you about holding an urgent statement this afternoon on the very worrying news coming out of Aberdeen? It is being reported that hundreds of people are set to be moved out of their homes because of the presence of the potentially dangerous concrete rack. Aberdeen City Council says rack is in 500 homes in the Balnagask area, including 364 council properties. I have been pressing the government for almost a year to get serious about the dangerous concrete. We have helped uncover its presence in schools, hospitals, universities, colleges, fire stations, police stations, courts, and yes, homes. Now this news from Aberdeen will turn the lives of hundreds of people upside down. I'm sure members from across the chamber will want to uh, join me in asking this afternoon, if possible, the government questions about the timescale on which this will occur. Does as soon as possible mean immediately, days, weeks or months? Uh, where will these be people, people be rehomed temporarily or even permanently? Was the Scottish Government aware that this decision was about to be taken? What precisely was contained in the report given to Aberdeen City Council a week ago that has caused this decision to be taken? What has changed and what impact does it have on policy in the rest of Scotland? The SNP Government has been too casual about this from the very start. I've uncovered a pattern of this Government not telling Parliament, ignoring it internally and cutting budgets. The news today from Aberdeen must force the government to, to be open with Parliament, to come to it this afternoon. So can I ask you, presiding officer, as to whether you have been contacted by the government on holding such an urgent statement this afternoon? Uh, thank you, Mr Cole Hamilton. Um, I am not aware either of the reports or any uh, approach uh, in relation to a statement. You'll be aware, Mr Cole Hamilton, that the business for the week is uh, agreed in Bureau and that has been approved by uh, Parliament, but the comments that you have made, I'm sure, will have been noted. Uh, it is now time to move on to the next item of business. There will be a brief pause before we do so. <laughs>